Buenos noches, YouTube. We're back for volume eight of bench racing. I'm here at the handsome Chris Mitchell's headquarters, and you can't see it out of frame, but there's about 30 people in the background here. So this, this might be the best attended episode of bench racing that we've done so far. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll start to introduce the panel that we've assembled here this evening. It's an all-star assembly of talent. To my left, former Autumn Colors Classic champion, Fine purveyor of the number 22 hot rod just behind me here. None other than handsome Chris Mitchell making his second bench racing appearance. Over on the end here, eight time Port the Speedway track champion, two time Autumn Colors Classic winner, four time appearance, or four appearances, I should say, to his record at the loaded ACT Invitational at New Hampshire Motor Speedway. It is none other than old school Dan McHattie making his first appearance on bench racing. And to my right, the innovator of the Oscar Modified Tour Beard Wars. He catches cruise missiles with his bare hands. None other than Josh Guns making his first appearance. I'm stoked. We're pumped up. We were talking a lot off, off camera about everything that we wanted to, to get towards. So first topic, I mean, all three of you guys grew up in this area. You race in this area. I mean, we're in the core of the Lakes region here. I mean, we've had Canadian Tire Motorsport Park no longer with us. Court the Speedway. It's got the shutters out. I mean, Peterborough Speedway is, is going strong right now. To put it lightly, the landscape around here has changed dramatically in the last year. I mean, I'd love to hear you guys weigh in on that. Let's start with you, Chris. Yep, for sure. Um, there's been changes galore happen. Spence, you know that. We've seen it all. The uh, Thundercar Division at Peterborough Speedway was one of the best attended Thundercar Divisions in Central Ontario. Uh, we had, I think, 16 late models appear at uh, Peterborough Speedway out of the blue a couple, I think, through three weeks before the end of the year. Um, and if you, would bet, if you would bet me <laughs> that was going to happen at the beginning of the year, I would have lost my shirt. I mean, hats off to, to JP and everybody else at Peterborough Speedway. No, you're right. But honestly, though, if you look at what's happened with Peterborough Speedway in the last little while, they're doing a great job. They've, they've changed a lot of stuff for the fans, the uh the track itself has made a ton of changes. There's no smoking section. There's all kinds of stuff that they've been doing lately at Peterborough Speedway. That's been a great addition. Baby change tables, new additions for the concessions. They've been doing a really, really good job. So as much as the other tracks have folded, um, I gotta pay kudos to Dave and JP and the rest of the staff there. They're uh, they're really paying attention and they're listening to the feedback from everybody else. They've been posting Facebook uh, posts regularly, letting people know what's going on, and I think that's very important in today's day and age. And uh, I got to hand it to them. They're doing a great job. Dan, let's go in the hot tub time machine and go back two <laughs> years. And I tell you that of the three tracks operating in this area, that, that Peterborough Speedway not only would be the last remaining track in this area, but it would be thriving better than it has been in the last decade, at least. Definitely. Would you, would you, would, did you yeah. see that coming? No, I didn't. Uh, I haven't got full enjoyment out of the uh, baby change tables yet, but <laughs> they have made a lot of improvements to the track, trying to put the softener down on it. Uh, He's, he's doing a great job. It is a great facility. Uh, no, I would not have seen that coming. Uh, we all know Korth is a fantastic uh, speed plant. You know, it's, it produces great racing. Uh, Mossport, it's been around for a long time. Absolutely a fantastic facility on the whole. Uh, maybe didn't get looked after, and, and maybe that's how some of it went downhill. Maybe saw that one coming. They had some pretty poor car counts the last number of years. Uh, but you, you got to commend the guys that did support it, the fans that supported it. They were, <clears throat> it was kind of a, a niche kind of thing. You never really saw a lot of Mossport people go elsewhere, nor did you see a lot of people. Like, I, I remember going to see you know, guys like Tom Walters, uh, Robbie Thompson, all those guys going and run an all star race there. And, you know, it's a tough place to get around. The guys like Kyle Donaldson, uh, Dwight Brown, those guys were fantastic. It's a very technical track. It was tough. I sucked there. Uh, you know that's what it is, uh, but it, it, it kind of fell by the wayside. Like I said, not much, not much attention uh, to the facility itself, track itself. Went downhill, lost cars, lost people. That's what happens. Uh, you got to remember, it's uh, you're in an entertainment business. You're not. It's not for me and Chris or, or Josh. It's an entertainment business to entertain the fans. You got to provide the entertainment. Now, before I let you chime in here, I just want to let everyone watching know. That we're sitting on an actual bench for the first time in the history of bench racing we are bench racing on an actual bench and i just felt like i needed to get that out there so grazie we we spoke about peterborough and everything that peterborough's doing doing right and we spoke about you know whether or not we saw this coming with with ctmp and with kawartha folding up i'll ask you with with kawartha and canadian tire motorsport park being gone now are we going to be feeling 
the after effects of these two speedways being gone for the next couple of seasons? Yeah, I think so. Um, just the, the level of competition is, is going to be better at Peterborough. I mean, there's going to be a lot more cars there. Like the other two tracks, I mean, it's unfortunate that Kawartha closed. Uh, great facility. I, I raced there. It's awesome. I like it. I still like it. It's the best track. You know, there's only a couple races there a year now, or well, two this year. But um, Mossport was, uh, or CMPT, uh, it was... I, uh, I, I, I miss the times. name Mossport. I really do. I miss <laughs> Mossport. Mossport just Mossport, rolled off the tongue. Mossport, Mossport, whatever. It's just it so was, much easier. Uh, I ran there a couple times with the Thunder Car. And, yeah, it was fun. I ran there with the Mod too. So, I mean, it, again, it's it's got its own thing. I mean, Quarth is good. I like it a lot. But Peterborough, I mean, it's it's the last one. It's around. So, what are you going to do? This is what it is. So I mean, you you got to go. Go get familiar. It's good. It's good. You get you turn lots of laps there. It's going to be or it is competitive. All the classes are. You look at the Thunder cars. Like I mean, they had uh, 16, 17 cars out at the end of the year. In a good division. There was a lot of talent on the Peterborough Speedway Thunder cars. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, you know, Matt Spence, Donnie Beatty, um, all the guys are running good. Robinson running. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Stewie Robinson Jr. Yeah. So. Were you guys surprised? at how few former Quartha regulars found a new home track this year. I mean, there were, I mean, you raced at Peterborough, but it, it, you couldn't really call it your home track. You, you, you dabbled at Peterborough. Brian Mercer was up there a couple of times. I think Ryan Kimmel might have had three starts around the province this year. Dwight Brown didn't race anywhere. No. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, the, the bottom line is not a lot of Quartha guys went elsewhere. I mean, there was a lot of equipment that stayed at home. Are, were you surprised at that? And are we going to see the same thing with the former Mossport regulars? I, I think so. And I, I think, to sadly to say, I think it'll get worse. Um, I think with, uh, speaking on behalf of the late models, a lot of guys were kind of in limbo because, you know, it's kind of the start off with is a lot of people got to realize that with racing Ontario right now, you know, you've got this many cars and you're dividing it up into this many tracks. You've got to find a way to get this many cars to be able to race at all those tracks. And it's not really a promoter's problem, uh, not fully a promoter's problem, as it is the, the driver's problem too. And the driver's got to realize that it's no longer, this is my track, these are my rules, we're letting you come in and race. And I think that that's kind of what it was with our guys is finding a home to go race our cars and, and trying to mesh with the rule package that was already there. You almost need to just redesign the whole rule package and say, we're going to make all these cars run competitively, competitively together. Uh, you look at what we did at Kawartha, you know, Summer Sizzler. Jason Hathaway came in and kicked her ass. Uh, you know, Chris Morrow came in and won the Summer Sizzler as well, plus won the points. Uh, we've also had some prolates come in and run well. You look at the Autumn Colors. Everyone seems to mesh well in, in the late model, like the pro late class, the way it is. I won it a couple of years ago. Um, Brandon Watson won it the year before that, I believe. And um, so I won it in an act car, Brandon a pro late, Mike Bentley in a limited late. <clears throat> There's a way to get all the cars to run together. And, and that's kind of what you need to do is you need to address the rule packages instead of fitting cars in. And I think that's where you ran into problems was kind of not a lot of guys wanted to go and fit into a track. They wanted to be part of the class that was there. And I think it's going to get worse, and especially with the you know, Mossport closing. A lot of those guys were on a little different rule package than a lot of the other tracks around. They don't want to go to a track that, yeah, we've made ex- exemptions for you to fit. They want to go to a track where this is our rule package. Yeah. We're already part of it. Uh, you know, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. What do you think, Hanson? Because we're going to see a lot of Mossberg guys put the put the equipment in the field and walk away from well, it. We saw a few of the guys that, that went from Corth to Mossberg, Link Brown or uh, Owen Smith, come to mind simply because they had to make no changes to the car. They were allowed to compete directly from Corth to Speedway down to Mossberg. They could show up, and I think they ran as they were, if I'm not mistaken. They ran as a, yeah, More they ran at, they ran as an act package. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they allowed the limited lights with the at the Existing limited lates run a little bit of their package. Than what and they when JP tried to amalgamate to the limited late class of Hebrew, the idea was that he had that class existing. He wanted to minimize the costs associated for his guys that had supported the division all along. So the guys that were new coming in had to make the changes to their cars to be competitive. And unfortunately, what you saw was the guys that did come, Dan, Merce, 
uh, Craig Graham, Mike Wallace, the guys, Kimball when he was there, those are some of your top runners that ran somewhere else. So the rules package that they came up with was maybe not indicative of how we were able to run together because those guys that came to run with us are arguably some of the best guys that ran at Kawartha anyways. I mean, Mercer spent a ton of money. Dan's got a brand new car. I mean, a lot of these guys have spent the time, have the knowledge, have the ability to be competitive no matter where they run. So it's not necessarily, it's a weight penalty or this or that. If there is a tiny little advantage, those guys, their race programs are so good that that little advantage means way more to them than it might mean to a guy that wasn't able to be as competitive as Kawartha, at Kawartha, pardon me, um, coming into Peterborough. It, it may not have shown quite as much. So Dan's right. There's got to be a way we can make all those cars come together. The pro late division, when they run at the autumn colors, I mean, arguably you have some of the best of the best. So maybe those cars that do compete against each other, um, they are a little more competitive because all of those guys' programs is at the, the top echelon of the guys. Comparing, comparing apples to apples. Apples to apples, for sure. And when you talk about the autumn colors pro late model division, and you see the, the, the menagerie of, of cars that show up, they can, they can all compete essentially on the same level. It's similar to what Sunset had with the MRE Pro Series, because you, you, you had act cars, you had pro late models, you had limited late models all come together, and they were all essentially on a level playing field, were they and, not? And you know what? It definitely was. And it's like anything. And Derek always went by this model too. It's a work in progress. And I know with the MRE Series, uh, it was maybe weighted a little bit towards their home track cars to start with. But you know what? Com I commend them because they adjusted the rules to make it as they went along to make everybody competitive. And by the end of the race, you had Brandon Watson went in a pro late well, with I think a 602 in it. Yep. And you had uh, jo Jonathan Erland running well with yep. an act car. You know, there's a way of getting it all there. And before, before it gets detrimental to racing in Ontario, you really need to come together. And you can't put the blame all on the promoters because the promoter, same as JP, he was looking after his home track cars yes. that supported their show for years and years and years. Not the guys that left to go to Quarth and not the guys that when Kim Wallace owned the track left to go to Mossport. He supported the guys that had been there all along. And, and you can't blame him for that, but at some point, the racers themselves have to have the idea that, listen, six cars this year, five cars next year, I'm not going to have a track the year after. We've got to find a way to all come together. And then if everyone can get on, get on the same page, then you have a little more uh, ability to go to track to track to track. And Mark Dilley was very open when, when, when word of Kawartha's closure was coming down and he was contacted by, I'll, I'll say, a half a dozen late model drivers from Kawartha Speedway asking if there's any way that the ACT package could be integrated into the Sunset late model or limited late model rule package. Mark Dilley flat out said, I got to support the guys that stuck with me. It's, it's going to open up a can of worms and I just, I can't do it. It's easy to say that when you got 20 cars there. Exactly. Six cars I mean, there, we, we, the Sunset thing. had a pretty good looking sandbox at the time. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yes. No question. So. Put yourself in the mindset of a guy that, that ran at Kawartha or Mossport. They've taken some time off. Is it likely that we're seeing guys in a, in a rebuilding year where they're sort of getting their programs refocused and figuring out where they want to go next? Or are we just seeing a mass exodus of guys that once they're gone from the sport, they're gone for good? It's hard to say. It all depends on how their equipment was uh, or is. Um, and having the knowledge and the time and the money, if they want to change it over to do what they're going to do, then they're going to go, they're going to find a spot. Some guys may say, you know what, I'm not into it anymore. Um, I just, I don't, I don't want to do it anymore. And they sell off their stuff and they'll get out of it. Or they'll find a, a different class to run in. And uh, I think that's, that's what will go with, with any of those guys that are going to. They want to do that. And I mean, it, it might open up the door for something like the Oscar Modified Tour or even the Lucas Oil Sportsman Cup that are that provide a somewhat affordable uh, alternative. And I, the, the affordable, <laughs> affordable when you don't destroy it, alternative to running on a weekly basis. I mean, the, the Lucas Oil Sportsman Cup chassis can be had for for very very cheap. They run a shortened schedule. It's not uh, it's not particularly expensive to get into. That could be an attractive. Uh, Route for these guys. Absolutely, you could change the division if you want. Uh, you can run a mod. You could, you know, same thing. Lucas car, you can pick them up. Uh, I'm, you know, I don't want to put a price tag on anything good or bad, but I mean, um, versus something going to uh, Mike McCall and picking up a limited late model for 50 G's. Exactly. So I mean, if you still want to do it and that's fine, then you know your class is not really going to work out for you at the track that you're running at. You know, you can switch up, try something different. Uh, you can get into a touring series if you want. Try out some different tracks. You know, are you going to go to Barney on a re on a weekly basis to run your limited late model? Um, not saying you're 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 not a part of that. 
you know, uh, class that's there, but if you want to try and go to that track, um, or anywhere in Ontario, right? So, I mean, you want to run up to Laird and try that? Sure, why not? Pack a lunch, I mean, because Sault Ste. Marie is far. <laughs> it's real. I, I've yet to go to Sault Ste. Marie. I mean, it's it's eight hours, I think, something like that. Yeah. So hats off to Mike Hardy and George Wilson and all the other uh, fellas that can that can make that haul. That's a little bit. Congratulations cool. to George on the big win. Also, congrats to George Wilson <laughs> on the on the big memorial victory up there. I think he, he almost made it out without a scratch on the car. He had a Looks small there, scuff, a but other than that, it was uh, <laughs> it was cool. almost uh, perfect looking. So shout out to George Wilson. He'll be back at the Sunset Speedway Velocity for you Oscar fans. He'll be back. Make sure you're there. Nice. We were t- that was a nice plug, right? <laughs> we were talking off camera about Crate Lake Model Racing and how it's 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 just revolutionized the class. You guys are making some great points, so let's just sort of paddle back to where we were, you know, 40 minutes ago. We'll get it on camera this time. <laughs> Maybe a little longer than that. We'll get it on camera this time. Tell me about the Crate Lake Model Division and the prolates and where we're at right now. It's been the best thing that happened to it, and it's been the worst thing that happened to us. And the reason I say that is because it, it's kind of taken the the it's a, it takes you have to look at the whole picture. So. We were talking about the success of the Thundercar division at Peterborough Speedway. Yes. So let's start there. So that class, in my opinion, has been successful because of the rules that they would not allow to be implemented. So nothing against Mike. I understand that completely. As a racer myself, and, and we have the ability to do that, in my mind, I love picking up the phone and saying, I need this part. And you get it. It's the same every time. It's consistent. You're not scrounging trying to find it. And that's great as far as I'm concerned. But the, the Thundercar division was designed to be a stepping stone. And when you all of a sudden have to spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, maybe even more, I don't know. That's on the low but end, yeah. <laughs> to get into a class that is supposed to be a stepping stone to a limited late, I mean, there's some great deals on limited late model cars out there right now to be had. Camera's car is a perfect example of that, where you could spend a third of what you would have to do to buy a competitive Thunder car in today's day and age, or street stock, whatever you want to call them. Um, so that that leads me into going where we're going with the crate lates, is that it's it's good because those that have the ability to buy the parts and pieces and do everything and, and run the big shows and, and whatnot have the ability to do so. But those that don't, the gap between the two, I mean, they have to get that knowledge somewhere, right? And unfortunately, if you're gonna get that knowledge, generally that means you have to pay for it somewhere along the line. So you gotta create late model, that's great, that's fine. But now all of a sudden you don't have a motor that can make up for an ill handling car. So you have to have the knowledge to make that thing turn. And then what happens is you end up having a bunch of cars that can all go at the same speed. And it's created the type of racing that we have in today's day and age that unfortunately, it either ends up being a train race or somebody has to make a mistake or the guy that's following the guy in the lead of the train needs to force him to make that mistake. And you know, good or bad, it is what it is. And it's exciting for the fans to see. It creates some rivalries and whatnot. The on-track action that you see can be somewhat questionable at times, but unless, you know, that guy needs to be considerably faster than you if he's going to get that pass. So we really need to focus on the ability to make that car turn. And and that's where you're going to make up all of your time is in the corners with a crate mate. You've got to keep your momentum going. And if you can't get the setup in the car to the point where you're, you're at that competition level, then there's not a lot that you can do to, to get back to where you are. So that's where the bad portion of that comes in. So it's good that everybody has the same kind of stuff, but it's bad because it, it takes away any advantage that somebody may have been able to look at a rule creatively or make their own ideas or or get a better engine builder or build a motor yourself where you you know you kind of just stumble across something and, and it works for you, right? So maybe Dan can speak. Yeah. Dan McCaddy, yeah. gift, is it a gift or a curse? Crate I'm racing. I'm gonna be pulling the resident old timer here. <laughs> <laughs> Because I raced a lot when you you had belt motors, and uh, and the, and what it really comes down to, everybody has their own certain amount of money they can spend. So <clears throat> when you spent twenty five grand on or thirty grand on a motor, and you spent twenty five grand on a car, now you spend seven or eight grand on a motor. Now you spend fifty grand on a car. Everyone's still got the same amount of money. There's that amount of money that that's out there to be taken in by the guys that are supplying cars. But my point is there's guys that are trying to compete that are spending 10 or 15 or less. The one thing I think that I like about the crate motor, and I'd be fine going back to built motors, and I think that the one thing about the crate motor is at least everyone knows what you got under the hood. And in in the pit area, a lot of things are policed by the guy parked beside you. So when he's sitting there looking at your car, he can see everything that's on your car. And by all means, everything on my car is there for you to look at when you have built motors 
the question comes in, and well, you know, what does he have under the hood? He can't physically see what's under what's in the motor. Uh, I, I like the crate engine because it's all there out in the open. Take a look at her. See, yeah. around our parts, we call them thunder cops. <laughs> it's the, they're thunder cops. There's there's a couple of them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good police force. It is what it is because it happens in NASCAR too. You know, sprint cup racing is policed by the by the guy parked beside you. He sees something different on the car. Walks around to the tech guy and says, "Yeah, you know that guy's got all the." A couple of years ago, when they went to the COT cars, all of a sudden they started, you know, using the great big diameter sway bars. Next thing you know, one company happened to pick up a sway bar from another company after tech, and oh, oh yeah, sorry, we didn't mean to pick up your sway bar. <laughs> you know, it's it's policed by your competition. Now, not only like crate crate racing has become a, a huge foundation for the late model division, but the upstart Oscar Modified Tour also relies very heavily on uh, on the crate engines is that going to be the future of this division or can you see them getting away from the crate engines is it a possibility that more guys are going to be running built power where's the Oscar modified door heading right now um i think you'll see a lot of guys around the 602 um they're competitive in the cars that that have them right now uh brent mclean is around 602 um max yeah max bjorn max very Bjor. right there 602 is max. running good uh, a lot of davy terry up front yep. so I mean I personally think that's that's gonna be your advantage um, cost wise you can buy one for four thousand dollars versus a built I, I don't know I've never I've never ran a built so I, I don't Let's know how much they cost. River over here. What is, what is a, what is a built <laughs> motor send you back nowadays you know what you're spent you're basically you're, you're spending a minimum of 20 grand for a good built motor now there's gonna be guys that are saying well I can build a motor for seven grand but <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna build a motor for seven grand, and sure you can. I used to get mine done for that too, but I had a friend that did it. If you're Joe Blow off the street, going to buy your built motor for the first time, and you're, you know, you're gonna to go to John, you're gonna go across the border and pick one up, you're gonna spend 18, 20 grand minimum. Wow. But that, that, what Dan's saying though is, to a certain degree, a one-time investment. If you don't blow it up and you just have to rebuild it, sure, they're more expensive to rebuild than it is, but that. That cost isn't necessarily you're spending 20, 20, 20. I, there's only a select few that can do that, right? So, you know, I agree with you that there it wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing to go back to a built motor if you had that option. I mean, you've kind of seen that happen a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, you see such a huge mix of it. And all your previous versions of bench racing have touched on that a little yes. bit. Where you see some guys, I think Witty's on a built. Witty I is think, on a built. Uh, uh, Gordy Shepard at Barry now is on a built, if I'm not mistaken. I believe so. Yeah. Anthony Simone at Sunset also on a built. There are more guys that are Cam going Rath. back. Cam Rath has a huge... Huge motor in that car. You do, car? See, you do see a lot of guys going back to the boat because it, it, it seemed as though we, we were in the, the church of the crate engine for, for three or four years and it was just, oh, your car's not hooking up, put a crate engine I in. I think the other thing, though, too, is uh, it relieved the tracks of a lot of issues. No longer are they concerned about tearing motors apart and tacking them. It's, yep, it's got a seal on it. It's okay. <laughs> you know, and, and don't, you know, it, it is true. It, yep. it relieved them a lot of tacking issues. Uh, as long as it's got a crate engine, it's fine. How many crate engines do you get tear apart? But that opens the door to what happened on the ACT sure. tour there though, right? For sure. So yeah. all of a sudden you see an engine that's sealed, oh, it must be fine. And, and all of a sudden, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that that motor's sealed, right? So uh, there's a lot create. of... Yeah. <laughs> create crate. I love it. It's uh, an interesting way of looking at things. So we'll switch gears a little bit from, from late model racing to back to the thunder, you, you, you guys touched on the Thundercar division and how good it is at Peterborough right now. And I hope I don't catch a lot of hate right now from the Thundercar Superstock <laughs> division. I mean no disrespect. What in the world has happened to the Thundercar division? I mean, if you go back five, six years, I would, I, I, it would be the best division in the province. It would be, you'd have parity, you had big names, you had guys that were touring around the province. It seems as though you're getting less and less of that everywhere. I mean, Flamborough Speedway, seven seasons ago, had the best Thundercar division in the province. Now, I mean, they're struggling on a normal night to, to get up into up 12, 13, 14 cars. Sunset, we've had one car run away with the show 90% of the, of the nights we've had. Barry Speedway has had a good division this year, but now you're hearing they're almost their entire top seven are getting ready to, to jump ship and whether they're ready to retire like a Dave said, or they're moving up like Daryl St. Ange and Jim Bolesky and Rick Wald. It just seems as though we have a mass exodus coming of guys jumping into the Thundercar division. And I guess what I'm asking is what can we do to stop this and why is it happening? Cost. 
Peterborough Speedway is a prime example of that. We touched on it just a few minutes ago, and I think that's probably your basic factor on it. And I'll speak, I don't want to put everybody, paint them all with the same brush, but I know in my, my own experience, so I'll speak of that, is that I had a Thunder car and I had to start there because that was the price range that I was in. And as much as I was in that car, I was there at Quartz level looking at Dan and saying, oh, I'm on a label, right? And unfortunately, maybe it's not everybody, maybe it was just me, I don't know. But it was a lot easier for me to get, acquire that Thunder car and then slowly but surely, oh, I want two uppers. So you spend a little money on it. And I want a foot box with a uh, brake bias valve in it. So then you spend a little more money. So now you got dual masters on it and then, oh, I want low bolts. So it, it's a lot easier to make a little change at a time, but it's easy if you have the car already. If you're a guy that wants to go from a mini stock to a thunder car, and now all of a sudden you're like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's unbelievable. It didn't used to be quite that bad, or at least in my experience, it wasn't. So some other guys may argue with me, but like I say, I'm just speaking in my own experience. You got to do what you got to do. And you say, you talk about guys leaving. That's good. You know what? It, it is good. You need guys to move up through the ranks. You need some of the thunder car guys to move up and live in the lates. And you got to do whatever you can to encourage them to. But you also need the backfill. We really need to encourage some of these kids that are running the mini stocks, uh, help them out in any way possible. But you really need to encourage them to move up, and it's tough because it is a big step. It used to be a big step to you know to get from a, a late model, a pro late model, to a super late. You know, it's not as much anymore now that the super lates are having the seal, the you know the sealed engines uh, and stuff like that. But you well, know, don't you think that in itself is the problem where you don't get that backfill because you, you look at a guy that's moving from the Thunder Car, he says, "What you got to do this to, anyways?" You really got to. You really got to encourage that. And I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Yes, it is expensive to have a Thunder car, but at what point do you say, listen, you can't go out and get an 88 or an 85 Monty SS at the records anymore. Yeah. At what point do you say, you know, our friend uh, Willie, for example, searches all over to find a Monty SS in someone's yard, and pays 2,500 bucks because he needs the steel roof to run the Kimmel series. Yeah. At what point is a $1,700 fiberglass body better than the $2,500 roof? Fast time Willie Ryan's, by the way. Shout outs. <laughs> Come back to Ontario. That's right. We miss you. <laughs> Come back. So. You were saying. <laughs> but, but it, it, you know what, it is. And there's lots of guys that'll, 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 that'll say, and uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not promoting one way or the other, but there's a lot of guys that have the means, have the opportunity, or they've got, they'll say, that, I got five Camaros in the backyard, I got the frames, or I know a guy who's got this and that. Okay, what if I came to you and say, I need those five frames? And then it's, well, he doesn't want to get rid of them, he doesn't want to sell them, or it's tough to get those parts now. So at what point is it cheaper to fabricate a frame now? Don't, you know, nothing against Pike again. I don't think it's a good idea to say, you can only buy these cars from certain people. Because the way I grew up was learn how to build it yourself. So the, the, the McCall Racing Enterprise Thunder Car, and you guys are definitely going to shed more light on this than I ever could. <laughs> I know for a fact, from what I know, there, there's, there are two of them currently running in Ontario. Caden Lapsovich has one. Todd Davenport has the other. Um, Lapsovich has been a solid mid-pack car in it. Doesn't have a feature win yet. Uh, Todd Davenport has run a little bit better in his, but again, he hasn't been blowing the doors off of anyone. So it looks as though those cars right now on the surface are, are competing no different than yeah. your normal, uh, you know, your, your traditional Thunder Car or Super Stocks would. Is this new chassis a benefit to the division or is it going to eventually make things a lot tougher on the guys running? I don't think so because let's say Josh wants to maybe part out his modified and, uh, <laughs> and decide he's going to run a Thunder Car. You know how much of a how much does it cost him, labor and everything to find a stock frame, and build a thunder car chassis out of that stock frame, stock panels and everything, than it is to buy a fabricated frame. And by all means, anyone who thinks that a McCall car or, or someone else is going to have all these fancy tricks, you know, control arms in different places. I had a lot of friends over the years, 10 years of Thunder Car racing, that we moved control arms around all over the Hell's Half Acre on the stock lip car. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> to get what you want out of the thing. It's already happening. It's already there. The guys that are... It's, it's a manipulation. It's been happening more than 10 years. It's been happening since 1990 when I ran Challenger Cars and you weren't supposed to do it. It's, it's just a fact of the matter is. But that's where I get to... You know, it's the same as the crate engines. 
when you have a certain person you can go to and that's only you're limited to only one person the price inches up a little bit and again i fully promote working in your shop at home with your dad build a car there's an article in this month's circuit Talk magazine that talks just about that a lot where they they suggested a kit car might be an option because one of the reasons why Mike's cars are expensive is because of the labor that goes in them. If anyone's ever been to McCall Racing Enterprises, I mean, they do phenomenal work. Yeah. And I will never take anything away and from you them. you got to pay those guys. It's labor intensive. So if you could get a kit from Mike where the bars are already bent, you bring it home, Dad, and, and you assemble it in the garage, do the labor end of things, weld it up. There's a, a viable market for that car, in my opinion, because Dan's right. You don't buy a Monty at out of the records anymore. I mean, if they did have one, they crushed it because it was worth more as scrap steel exactly. than it was worth to, to yeah. sell that car to somebody. So, I mean, it's a it's a tough call. I mean, I, if somebody was just getting started in it and had to, to buy all of that right out of the gate, then it's a extremely cost prohibitive as far as trying to to come up with that all in one shot. So if you could buy a decent used car that's, that's gonna be competitive, then uh, I think that may be why somewhere like Peterborough is good because, and, and again, you say no slight against anybody and I, and I don't ever mean it to be that no. way because I understand exactly where they're coming from. We love but everyone. A guy like show. Brad Laval, for example, can go to Peterborough and have a decent run every now and then. You know, he's not winning features every week, but he's out there and he can run, run, well. run okay. Yep. You know, he's running mid pack. I think he, he may have won a couple of heats. I think maybe this year. And if he goes to Sunset, what's happening when the rocket? Uh, he's going to get lapped in a heat. I think the rocket's going to lap anyone so right now. Peterborough's I mean, rule package might be attractive to, to those guys because it, it just yeah. minimizes the cost involved. Unfortunately, at, at some point, and, and you know what. When I got it, when I started in a Challenger class, my dad raced the Challenger class. My dad was in, in the Challenger class when it first started. Tire track. At, <laughs> P, at Peterborough Speedway. And, and to see what it's progressed, you know, when I got in the Challenger class, it was far less than what the Thunder cars are now. The sportsmen's at the time are far less than what the Thunder cars are now. Yes. Uh, the super lates are less than what the limited lates are. It's in racing as well too, all over the country. It's a progression in the class. And as, like Chris says, you know, hey, you already have the car, let's add this to it. Well, you know what, it's more efficient to add this to it. You know what, these old parts are coming down from the super lates, let's add them to our Thunder cars. It, every class is always gonna progress. And you kind of, and that's why the mini stocks came into, you know, you always got to, you backfill in with a class again, same as the drivers, you the back fill in with the four funds. Right? <laughs> and now you got the four funds. I don't know what you're going to have next. You might have a garbage can with wheels. I don't know, but I don't know what else you can find, but you're, you're, you're always going to have that progression in the class. Josh, before you were a, a, a limousine riding, uh, wheeling, dealing, kiss stealing, modified regular. You had humble beginnings in the Thundercar division, so you're, I did. you're a bit of an expert on the Thundercar class. Uh, or I'm going to call you an expert right now on. Oh camera. yeah, absolutely expert. <laughs> Is this thing going to get worse before it gets better? Or, well, what's going to happen with the with the landscape of this division across the province? Uh, I don't know. I personally, I like the division. Uh, it's in my view, it's costly to run. Why would I spend um, so much money in a Thundercar when I can just buy a limited late and just run it. Well, okay, well, you, you flip open the parts book and you're like, yeah, I need this, I need that, I need that. Oh, cleaned off a corner, okay. Need some more <laughs> of this and more of that. Um, and I think it's, it's just, it's easier. Parts are more available. Um, show up at your door the next day? Yeah, so yeah UPS, house. yeah, big brown truck shows up. Yep, yeah, here you go, thanks. All right, you're out next week. You're not searching the, the junkyards. You're not, you know, trying to, you know, call up somebody that has five chassis in the backyard. Hey man, do you have any of this left over? Or, the problem is if know? he has five and he sells a couple, then there's, there's no more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, exactly. so is it, is it getting better? I, I want to say no, but I, I like the division. I still think it's, it's good. Um, the guys that are running it are great and you know, uh, it's good. So with Thunder cars or super stocks getting closer to what the limited late models are, I mean, they're, if you look at the sunset, Rules package, the, there's very little separating what was a challenger from, from a super stock, a, a, a modern day super stock. The, the, the class has progressed that much. So, is there a way that we might see the street stock division come back and sort of jump in where the Thundercar division was? I mean, because I don't know how many active street stocks there are. Sobel has maybe a dozen 
Varney might have the same on a, on a really good night, full moon, when no one has anything else to do. So call it 24 across the province. Is there a way that we can get more street stocks out to, to sort of give the mini stock kids a, a way to, to jump out of a, a front wheel drive, four cylinder powered car before they, before they get ready for a late model? How many rear wheel drive cars are there that's stock appearing in Durrells? Yeah, is that is that better than a than a four fun or or or, or a mini stock? Well, I mean, what are the Peterborough and Enduro numbers doing right now? How many how many cars are you gonna get in the Enduro Peterborough? I have no idea. Chris, uh, V8, rear wheel forty. Yeah, so that's there. not bad. It's, okay, it's not so, like it was either at one point in time, but they they kind of changed things a bit there. They they used to run all of them together, and then they split them into a four and six cylinder, and then an eight cylinder, and everyone runs together. And then when they were first got going, I ran in that series, right? We had a ton of fun with it, and for all intents and purposes, Speedway Enduro Champion here. <laughs> this guy, it was this a, guy uh, right here. It was like a roller demolition derby. But you know what? We never laughed so hard. I honest to God, right? And we ran for more money. I, I said that to Colin a, a few times, right? Like, I had a three hundred dollar car. I raced for a thousand dollars to win. A thousand dollars. Two hundred and fifty laps. I went and took a nap <laughs> during this race, and then came back. Eight, Eighty-five cars started the race. See, and and Delaware's enduro division in large part has withstood the test of time and, and it's it's probably the only enduro or street stock based class anywhere in the province that still has the numbers that they did a few years ago and the, the rule book is largely the same and I think that, that sort of speaks to why they're still around in the numbers that they are is that the Delaware enduro cars haven't changed and and when you see the thunder cars you know guys are are putting their hands up at the rules meeting in January yeah we want to go faster we want to get these more expensive parts and when it's time to pry the wallet open in March, it's, oh wait, you know, I, I don't have that, so maybe we're going to run a half season, or maybe we'll run four or five nights, or maybe we'll just take this season off, and I think in large part, that's what's happening in the Thunder Guard division. Possibly, yeah. It, I, I'm not going to lie, I did that with this. <laughs> with the modified, I don't know if you yeah, can yeah, get yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, no, Pan I, the camera it, over, this, it, this is the modified, is this a, work, is this a work in progress? Oh yeah, it's a work that's, in progress. Oh yeah. She's, that, that well, there's parts laying everywhere. She's a beauty. <laughs> it's get up and go is got up and left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> nice. I love you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I know we're getting long in time a little bit. So, yeah, Crystal Doucette saying, yes, we are, in fact, getting long in time. So, okay, Autumn Colors Classic. I feel as though I, I'm in pretty good company here to discuss the playoff season. So we're going to fast forward through the first couple events. Let's get right to the granddaddy of them all. ACC, you're a two-time winner. You're a winner. You'll be a winner one day. <laughs> yeah, thanks. What can we expect from this, edition, from this year's edition of the event? 2013, Dan, what are we going to see at the Autumn Post Classic? I, think, I saw it on Facebook there, and I saw someone posting saying, you know, bring your shorts, bring your t-shirt, you know, bring your flip-flops, bring your snow boots, bring your snow suit, bring your sweater, and that's what it is. Uh, you know, and it, it's the same as the racing thing, too. You never know what's going to happen. There's a ton of cars there. I look forward to it. Uh, my, personally, I like the idea that some of the greats like Jason Shaw, um, Brad Corcoran, Steve Laking, uh, you know, we used to get Kirk Hooker. I used to love, love racing with him. All these guys that I looked up to, you know, even racing with them, they're just far better than me. And to race against some talent like that is fantastic. Um, hopefully Larry Jackson comes and runs with us this year. <laughs> Better get his ass up there. He had the car out of the gold rush. Yeah, it, looked, it looked pretty good, yeah. so I mean, he didn't knock well, the pretty out of the He's a Canadian tire boy now, so. <laughs> Jim Bray, give Larry Jackson back to late model racing for one weekend only, please. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's know, calling just, <laughs> just, to, just to be able to race some, against some guys like that, and I'm a car guy. I, you know, I don't watch a lot of racing when I'm at the track, but I'll walk up and down the pits a million times because I love looking at the cars. I like seeing what guys are doing. Um, seeing what kind of equipment they're putting together. I gotta commend you know, a lot of the people in Ontario that put together, whether it's their families, or whether they're paying someone to do it, they put together some nice equipment and to see it all at one location. You know, like, cause like I say, you know, with the, with the low car counts these days, you don't see it all at one location. Oh, you don't. Autumn Colors Classic, you see it all there. And it's great. We're just now starting to get entry lists coming in. And, and we'll lead with the problem of the division because it's just easy to talk about. The talent's already signed up for it. In the last week, at the time of this airing, we've had Mark Watson, Jamie Cox, Matt Pritico, Dan McCaddy, yep. Mike Bentley, yep. Brad Corcoran, all confirmed that they'll be a part of the Pro Late Model Division. Chat with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What happened? It died. The battery died? It had no warning. 
like, what? Okay, no problem. I got, I got the power charger. Quick battery change, and we're back. This is a, this is a laid back production. This is this is no budget. I should preface this. If you haven't followed the last seven episodes, you know. So, Autumn Colors Classic Pro Light Model Division. Yep. Sean Channel with Matt Critico. Now it's Sean Channel this time. Number Matt one. Critico, Mark Watson. Yes. Dan McCaddy. Yes. Brad Corcoran. Chris Mitchell. Chris in a Pro Light. Chris Mitchell in a Pro Light model. That's right. Mike lights up Bentley. Yep. Could this be the best Pro Late model field we've ever seen in the Autumn Coast Classic? I think so. I'm super excited. I mean, if you take a look at the guys that we missed in the limited late model field, we've got a Pro Late ride now, so we can compete against them too. So I'd like to thank Al for uh, giving us that opportunity. We're going to be in an ACT car, so it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, Dan was able to win with his. So um, we've got some work ahead of us here. We're going to get it tuned up, a little test and tune tomorrow. So I'm, I'm super excited to be a part of that field as well. Um, it's always, you know, it's an interesting race. You hear lots of complaints about it. You know, it just turns sometimes a little bit long uh, in the tooth and as far as the cautions and everything else goes. So hopefully we can stay out of that. But again, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before. <laughs> so you get all this talent and all these cars, all these guys, there's only one winner. So how that guy gets there, I mean, you got a little bit of luck. You have a little bit of other bad luck. You have opportunity when it presents itself. You need to be in a position to take advantage of it. And, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see it happen. Uh, the Pro Late field is going to be awesome. The Limited Late field is going to be awesome. Um, you know, I, it's going to be tough with Ryan and I on the, uh, the front row. I've, I've got to get in line. Um, the outside groove this year is going to be brought to you by Dent Dynamics. Uh, we've done a little deal with JP to uh, put down the last, right before the Autumn Colors, we're going to have an uh, addition of two groove put on without any cars on it prior to the Autumn Colors. So hopefully that outside groove will be working. Um, we're gonna need it because uh, I think if we can get that to happen, you may see a little bit of the elimination of, of what we've seen in years gone by where it's been uh, root the guy out of the way on the bottom. Just a question, would you have paid to have it put on if you were starting on the inside? Uh, no. <laughs> it's interesting how this is gonna work out because uh, <laughs> if Ryan was on the outside, I probably wouldn't. Anyways, I am, so that's the way it's gonna go down. Uh, I'm excited to uh, get to get there. It's gonna be a great show. Josh Grunts, you will not be there as a competitor, but you will be there as a uh, adult beverage uh, uh, consumer. Consumer, oh, thank yeah. you. Um, you'll all. I mean, you're a fan first and foremost. Who are a couple of guys that we need to keep an eye on at the Autumn Clothes Class? Maybe someone that doesn't catch a lot of love from people in the media or fans, or or someone that like Dan. That's this. That's one, two of the last three, I think. No. Four. Seven. He wins a lot. <laughs> Who are a couple of guys that we need to keep an eye on at the Autumn Clothes Classic? How about uh, Don Beatty? Thunder car Future, extraordinaire. Future uh, former winner. Yes. Uh, Thunder car, he's quick. Yes. Uh, and he was uh, probably the owner of the biggest fan reaction. Uh, we're not gonna get into the incident of what happened last year if you had the Autumn Colors Classic. You know <laughs> I think the fans made more noise for Donnie Beatty in turns three and four when he was walking down pit road than anything else all weekend long. Was wow. out. I think that video. video was on YouTube more than Miley Cyrus was this past I, think I would, I would, it did a lot of, it, 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 I think, it, I think it almost, it, Viewed more than bench racing. It That's easily viewed more than bench racing. <laughs> easily, easily. I'm not even. I'm not even in the the same stratosphere as that as the Donnie Beatty uh, Dan Archibald video. So hopefully Donnie Beatty will be able to make headlines for his on track performance ending up in victory. Absolutely, all, yeah, good, for sure. With that he's Peter been fast Speedway, all year. With the Peter Bros Speedway Championship. I mean, he's coming in there as a as a contender. Who's someone else we should keep an eye on? Um, I don't know. Oh, maybe maybe Chris Mitchell. Yeah. We got a good Maybe. Car. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm kind course. of biased. I'm biased there. So you want a dark horse for the limited lates? You keep an eye on Corey Horner. I'm Corey you right Horner. Now. He's got a fast car. No one's, you know, and no offense against them again, but uh, he's going to be someone that maybe not given a lot of uh, pre-race credit to. And uh, I, I think if, if things go his way, I mean, he's got a great car. So I mean, I got to tie. I don't see Corey Horner as much as I would like to over the course of the season. I haven't been out to Peterborough all year, but in, in these interviews that we're doing and people that I'm talking to away from the track, I've heard his name a lot this year. So he's obviously doing something right to sort of catch some of the love that, that, uh, that he's got. I mean, what a massive moment that would be in his career if he could walk out with a, with a podium finish at the ACC. Absolutely. Big time. Anything else you want to add? 
No, I'm pretty calm right now. Josh, <laughs> and, and Josh Grunts will will take this car and be back for the Autumn Colors Classic 2016, guaranteed. 16. He'll be in the field. <laughs> Want to thank old school Dan McCaddy for his insightful commentary. If you want a little bit of behind the scenes stuff, we wanted to get Dan McCaddy and Larry Jackson for this shoot. Larry couldn't make it due to work commitments, so Dan McCaddy, the stud that he is, jumped up and, and said, you know, on, on zero days notice, I'll be a part of the panel with uh, Chris Mitchell and Josh Grunt. So I think he really added a lot. We're going to get him on future episodes. Chris Mitchell came through like a star, second appearance. We'll probably have him back. Josh Grunt's best beard on the panel puts my facial hair to shame. Thanks for coming through, my friend. This is Volume 8. Thank you for your support. Follow me on Twitter, at It's Spencer Lewis Grunts. What's the Twitter handle? Grunts31. At Grunts31. At Dent Dynamics 22. And old school Dan McCaddy is in the Kelly Balsa school of not having Twitter. <laughs> you can't follow him on social Flip media. Um, you can be his friend on Facebook. You can be his friend on Facebook, right. or he has a tin can with a string that you can uh, <laughs> Just connect to if all. you'd like to. So thank you for the support. We'll be back for Volume 9.